All right, so um, I'm putting the guide questions uh, for next time up on the screen here. So we're going to be doing, uh, so today we're reading some of Wordsworth's uh, theorizing about poetry. Right, for next time, you're going to be looking at two Wordsworth poems, and you're going to be uh, essentially measuring the extent to which he practices what he preaches, right? You're going to be reading uh, lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey and owed intimations of immortality. And this is what I want you guys thinking about, right? First, I want you thinking about how the poems incorporate notions that Wordsworth promoted in the preface, if at all. Secondly, in Tintern Abbey, what does the speaker seem to prefer? Solitary rumination or social life, and so what? Third, what is the relationship between the natural and the artificial depicted in Tintern Abbey? Fourth, what points about youth and age is the speaker making in the immortality of? And finally, what's the definition of immortality Wordsworth seems to be working with? in the immortality. What, do, what does he seem to think immortality means here, right? So take these down however you need to. Um, I am going to start talking a little bit about a few little housekeeping things. Uh, first thing I want to do is pass the bibliography for today's lecture around uh, so make sure everybody gets a copy of that. Um, I also have your first quizzes graded. Um, by and large, you guys did all right. This was actually about the best batch of first quizzes I've had in 2000 level class. Um, that said, not everybody did well, right? Some of you really, some of you still kind of flubbed it. So here is what we're going to do. Um, instead of doing 10 quizzes over the course of the term, we're going to do 12 and we're going to drop the two lowest quiz grades, right? So if you did not do well on, Mon on Tuesday's quiz, right, you will have opportunities to make that up, right? So if you got, say, like a zero or a one out of four on this quiz, that'll get dropped, provided you do better on other quizzes, right? Um, I am also doing this in part because I don't give makeup quizzes. Right, the quizzes are very small assignments. They're kind of dependent on you being here in class. And if, say, six of you miss class on a particular day, one, it's going to be nearly impossible to find a time when all six of you can be in the room and take the quiz together, right? Two, I'm not going to write six separate makeup quizzes so I can be, be sure that people you know, aren't communicating with each other about what's, what's on the quizzes and what's not. So, these are only going to happen in class. You have to be here to get a quiz grade. But I'll drop the two lowest. OK, any questions about any of that? Thank you, Noah. All right, so let me then just briefly go over the last quiz. I have, you know, they're graded. You'll get them back at the end of class. But let me just briefly go over um, what kinds of answers I was looking for from you. So question one right, was, when, when Equiano was in Virginia, which two objects in his master's house are particularly frightening to him? The answers I was looking for were the watch and the portrait. However, I did also give people credit for the slave muzzle, because that would be an incredibly terrifying thing to see on coming into somebody's house, right? Secondly. What does Equiano notice that the English don't do to each other, and how does he feel about this? What he notices about Engl the English associations with each other right, is that they don't sell one another. And he thinks this good, right? That's what I was looking for there. Third, what complaint does Captain Dorn make about Equiano after having purchased him, and how does Dorn propose to correct this fault? He complains that Equiano talks too much English and disputes too well. And he, correct, he um, threatens to correct this through violence. And fourth, what does Equiano witness specifically in the West Indies that makes him doubt the goodness and kindness of English Christians? Right? This is that passage where Christian master is italicized in a sarcastic kind of way. Right? 
what he witnesses is a guy beating and torturing an escaped slave. Okay, so those are the answers I was looking for for this, right? So these are the kind of details you should be looking out for as you're doing the reading in general. Um, are people still copying this down? Yes. We still need to leave this up? Okay, so keep working on that. Um, as far as the music is concerned that I was playing at the beginning of class. So what you were hearing uh, were piano nocturnes written by the Irish composer John Field who was active in the historical period we're talking about, right? He was born in 1782, dies in 1832. So he's right, composing primarily in the early 19th century. So really a little after Wordsworth and Coleridge uh, make their first publications, but still sort of within the same general um, era. Now, Field specialized in a style of music um, called a nocturne, or a type of composition called a nocturne. Do any of you know what a nocturne is in musical terms? Isn't a nocturne like an especially soulful one, sad kind of operatic thing? Uh, not, I think you might be thinking of an aria. Um, nocturnes typically don't have any vocal component. They're purely instrumental. Does anything about the name Nocturne suggest anything to you? No. Yes, exactly. So what we're talking about with a Nocturne is any piece of music that is inspired by or related in some way to the night, right? And the reason I wanted you listening to some Nocturnes is because we tend to associate the night with dreams and with rumination and meditation, right? And that is a big part of what Wordsworth's theory of poetry is about, right? It's, you know, the key words here, emotion recollected in tranquility, right? You don't start writing your poem at the moment you experience the emotion. You sit and you meditate on it for a while and you shape it into poetic form afterwards, right? So, Let me just give you a little bit of background on the preface itself, right? So, Wordsworth and his friend, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who we'll start looking at next week, um, publish a volume of poems together that they intend to be a revolution in English poetry. Right? So they're trying to publish poems that look different from anything that has hitherto appeared in English poetry. They're reacting against the values of the preceding period, the so-called neoclassical period. Does any, I know a couple of you took uh, Brit Lit One with Dr. Ryer, right? And this is kind of the period that she specializes in. Do any of you know or remember anything about neoclassicism? <laughs> Just didn't stick, huh? <laughs> okay. So what neoclass so if we look at the, the word neoclassical, right? What does neo suggest to us? New. Yeah, neo typically means new, right? And what about classical? What is classical supposed to refer to? Old. Pardon? Old. But a very specific kind of old, right? We're not talking about, say, old Anglo-Saxon or old Gothic um, or, you know, old um, Scandinavian. <coughs> when we talk about a classical culture, classical mythology, classical literature, it's referring specifically to the culture of the Greeks and the Romans, right? So when we talk about the when you hear scholars talk about the classical world, that's what they're talking about. So logically then, if we combine these two elements in this word, what are neoclassical 
artists, writers trying to do. And then you spend on the great, like, what was made during the time of the Greeks and the Romans? Or yeah. imitate it? Yeah, they're trying to imitate the works of the Greeks and Romans, right? So, what that meant, right, is that they were very much concerned with a couple of different artistic qualities, right? One, in poetry, was absolute metrical regularity, right? Poems were supposed to be written to match particular genre forms, right? And genres were organized in very strict hierarchies, right? The highest form of literature was the epic, followed by tragedy, followed by satire, followed by the elegy or the short lyric poem. Right? All of which were known classical genres, right? These were all genres that the Greeks and Romans wrote in and that English neoclassical writers in the 18th century are trying to adapt to an English idiom. So each particular style, or each particular genre required you to write in a different style. Yeah, Haley. What is the last one you said? It says elegy slash lyric, right? So basically, short poems that expressed an idea or an emotion were at the bottom of the hierarchy. People still wrote those, but they weren't particularly prestigious. Yeah, Michael. Where do, would pastoral poems fall under that? Low. Very low. Low, yeah. Too. So what, actually, this is one of the things I'm getting to, is that for neoclassical poets, um, poetry is an art. It's a craft that anybody can learn to do with practice and with knowledge. And so pastoral poetry, does everybody know what he means by pastoral poetry, what that is? Like, I, like romanticization of like, the outdoors and the rustic. Yeah, rural life, right? Poem, essentially poems about rural life, you know, shepherds dancing around, playing their oaten flutes, and uh, you know, not doing much um, apart from standing around near where sheep are, right? Um, so it's usually a very artificial version of rural life, right? It kind of, you know, eliminates all the hard work and animal shit um, from the picture. But yeah, um, pastoral was regarded as a genre that people practiced in, right? So it's something you write when you're learning to be a poet, and then you work your way up to these more important and prestigious genres, right? So Wordsworth and Coleridge try to overturn the whole enterprise in part by calling their combined volume lyrical ballads. Which is first published in 1798. It includes several poems by Wordsworth and a smaller contribution of mostly longer poems by Coleridge. And they divided up the workload, right? Wordsworth was the poet who was going to write poems celebrating rural life, and Coleridge was going to write poems on the supernatural, both of which were subjects that were largely banished from neoclassical poetry. Neoclassical poetry tended to be urban and sophisticated. And was aimed at educated, sophisticated urban audiences who could appreciate the craft of it. Yeah, Ashley, what were you going to say? So Wordsworth was going to write poems like celebrating rural life, but is mm -hmm. that kind of pastoral living, or is it kind of a different sort of? He, thing? It's it's a different spin on it. Well, for one thing, they're they're not aspiring to these other genres, right? They're denying altogether that this hierarchy matters or that it exists, right? So they're on the one hand celebrating the lyric, right? The classical form that is the lowest 
in the hierarchy here, and they're combining it with a European folk form called the ballad, right? The Greeks and Romans did not write ballads. Ballads are usually short, simple narrative poems that begin in the middle of the action and end before the action is completed. Um, that were composed and circulated primarily by ordinary people rather than by professional poets, right? So these are things that tended to circulate orally rather than in print. Although they were sort of, versions of them were coming into print uh, by the 18th century. Uh, what the hell is that guy's name? Um, a collection had been put together in 1765 by a guy named Thomas Percy. And he called it Relics of Ancient English Poetry. So on the one hand, he has to put the silly little Q-U-E at the end of Relics. But on the other, right, he's making a conscious reference here to Ancient English Poetry, right? the native poetry of the British Isles, not imitations of the Greeks and Romans. And uh, Percy is just part of a group of writers and scholars who are trying to dig deeper into native British artistic and cultural traditions and revive those in the middle and the end of the 18th century. Um, there's also um, a Scottish writer by the name of James McPherson who publishes a collection of poems that he claims were written by a medieval Scottish bard that he called Ossian. There was no Ossian. McPherson wrote the poems himself and tried to pass them off as the work of some ancient poet. But they ignored classical poetic values. Right? Along similar lines, um, there was a young poet working in London by the name of Thomas Chatterton who wrote forgeries of medieval English poems that were so good that people thought, oh, hey, here's the voice of an undiscovered medieval poet, right? This sounds just like Chaucer, right? This sounds just like John Gower. This sounds just like the great English poets of the Middle Ages. And of course, Chatterton's poems were also forgeries, right? He wrote them himself. And when he was discovered as a forger, he committed suicide. But, <clears throat> What's going on here, right, is a greater interest in, the development of an interest in British history and British culture, right? A kind of rising nationalism in Britain, right? that it's no longer good enough for us to imitate these older civilizations that had little to do with us and focus instead on the development of native forms and native traditions, or particularly those of the Middle Ages. In fact, that's actually where the word romantic comes from. The label itself has nothing to do with your feelings. It comes instead from the most important narrative form of medieval literature, which was the quest romance, right? Yeah, you know, you know a, a knight going off to you know rescue a woman from an ogre, or you know find some sort of magical chalice, right? That sort of thing. So there's a, in the very label romantic, which by the way most of these poets didn't apply to themselves; it was applied to them by other people. There's a sense of an, an attempt to return to medieval artistic values. Okay, so any questions about any of this so far? Everybody following? 
We're good? We're good. Okay. Right. Now, at the same time, there are certain debates in philosophy that end up affecting the composition of poetry as well. So we talked a little bit last time, um, not last time, but uh, last week about Edmund Burke and Mary Wollstonecraft and their very different responses to the French Revolution, right? So in their argument with each other, what does Burke rely on? What's, what's Burke's view of society based on? and organis and his view on society is that society has like a natural growth and that you should allow it to grow. Yes. Good. That society is a kind of natural growth based on tradition, right? That you shouldn't attempt to carve up according to particular rational plans, right? Now, what about Wollstonecraft? What was her response to this? What was her view of culture and society? She was a rationalist. Yes, rationalist. And what does this mean? What does it mean to be a rationalist? That society should be shaped in order to fit like order and specific ideals of people. Yeah, that we are gifted with reason, right? And if society isn't working out for everyone, right, then we ought to use that gift of reason, that power of reason, to plan and to shape society in ways that make things more fair, right? In ways that make society run more smoothly, right? That a rationally ordered society will run more smoothly, will be more fair, will be more just than one that is simply allowed to continue as it always has been unchecked, right? So I think I mean I use the metaphor of kind of pruning a tree, right? Burke would just let the tree grow wild. Wollstonecraft would try to prune it to shape a particular ideal, right? So you see rationalism referenced in various texts from the period. Whenever somebody's talking about reason, they're usually either making or reacting to a rationalist argument, right? And a rationalist essential belief, um, I think I said this a couple sessions ago, but just to restate it, right, is that the universe itself, right, is rationally ordered according to predictable patterns, right? The planets have predictable orbits. You know, we can tell what time the sun is going to come up in the morning every day. We can predict the change of seasons, right? Through observation, you know, we can predict how long it's going to take for a seed to sprout in the ground, right? So to a rationalist, everything is ordered by reason in this way, right? And you can observe and predict the behavior of pretty much anything in the natural world. Not so to an organicist. Now add to this mix the rise of two other philosophical traditions, empiricism primarily in England, and idealism primarily in Germany. Does anybody know what an empiricist is or what an empiricist believes? It does. Miracle is hard proof. Like. What do you mean by that? Unpack it a little bit. Um, I can. <laughs> in science, mm -hmm. you have empirical data. Yeah. Whereas in idealism, it's 
know, just that you can't prove it. Mm -hmm. we we're actually miracles. we're actually not talking about an idealism that's based on feelings necessarily, though, right? Or that's based right. on goals. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about empiricism, what we mean is right. The basic belief is that the only means we have of knowing anything is through our senses. Right, so we take in sense data, and those it kind of impresses itself upon the blank slate of our minds, and that's how we learn and grow, right? Through taking in new sensations. So for an empiricist, knowledge is based totally on sensation. For an idealist, knowledge is not necessarily inborn, right, but everything, like the things that are most real to an idealist are ideas, right? The highest form of reality is the idea, not the thing itself. Um, so how many of you are familiar at all with like Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Anybody feel, okay, you know Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Ashley. What, uh, what do you remember about it? Um, that a bunch of prisoners are put in a cave basically their whole lives, mm -hmm. and their face, their face toward the wall of the cave, and the only thing they can see is the shadows of the outside. So uh -huh. they base their ideas of what the outside world is based uh -huh. on the shadows and what they can hear. Right, and the basic idea here, right, is that we are the prisoners in the cave, and the things we see in the material world around us are just shadows of real things that we can't see, right? because we're not looking in the right direction. So this table, for example, right, is simply an inferior copy of some idea of a table. I can make a table um, because I, ha I can form an idea of a table, right? I have access to that mental image, which pre-exists the actual table. And then how good my material table is is going to depend on how, like, I'm just going to say, like, my my table would not not be very good. I'm not handy. Um, <laughs> I would not put things on it um, at all, uh, ever. But <clears throat> the basic point is, right, is that you're copying in the material world things that you form mental pictures of, right? The mental picture is the real thing. Everything in the physical world is just an inferior copy of that. So your imagination is truly real in that aspect. Exactly. The, yeah, the big idea here is that imagination is the most powerful thing, right? Imagination is the most important thing. And the Romantics are influenced really kind of by both of these ideas. Coleridge more so than Wordsworth. So we'll get a little deeper into this when we talk about Coleridge specifically. Uh, but. Wordsworth is influenced by it as well, so I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of this, because it'll help make sense of some of what he's doing in this preface, right? Now, it might also help us to know that while romantic poets and artists formed little clubs, they didn't necessarily see each other as parts of the same club, right? So Robert Southey, who was an associate of Coleridge's, um, they had a plan to move to Pennsylvania together and form a utopian commune um, that never quite panned out. Do they ever? What's that? Do they ever? Well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's always hope. Um, Southey organized his generation of poets and the next generation of poets into a couple of groups, right? So himself, And Wordsworth and Coleridge, he organized into a group he called the Lake School. These were educated poets. They'd all been to university. Upper middle class backgrounds. Lived out in the Lake District in England, so in the west of England, rural, rural west. And took their inspiration from Scenes of rural life. Who's the person on the top? Robert Southey. Um, we don't really read Southey much anymore because, well, frankly, his poetry kind of sucks. And that's how you spell it. 
That's how you spell it, yep, Suddy. Now Suddy proposed the existence of two other schools of romantic poetry as well. The first he called the Cockney School. Does it, do any of you know what a Cockney is? Isn't it like an accent? Yeah, it's a very thick working class London accent, right? So the fact that he calls another group of poets the Cockney School reveals a certain level of snobbery, right? These were people he regarded as socially inferior to himself. So these included the poet John Keats, the poet and publisher Lee Hunt, and the essayist William Hazlitt. These were people whom um, Sonny regarded as socially inferior, hence Cockney's speech. Working class writers trying to be like the late poets. Now the third, and the school he considered the most dangerous, as we can see by the name he gave them, he called the Satanic School. Not because they were actual Satanists, right? And I think one thing that we should note about this particular historical period is that very few people read the Bible literally in Britain in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, right? There were very few people who actually believed in a literal devil. The devil was typically used more as a symbol of rebellion against the natural order of things. Right, sort of taken from Milton. And so, what these poets were concerned with, at least according to their um, <clears throat> contemporaries, was these were poets of sort of rebellious cast of mind, right? politically or artistically. So these would have been people like Percy Shelley, uh, Lord Byron, and again, their friend Lee Hunt, who appears in two of these little groupings, right? Where's those two in the same school? Hmm? Shelley and Byron, mm -hmm. they'd be together. The other thing um, to note about the members of this school, with the exception of Hunt, right, is that Shelley and Byron had grown up essentially spoiled rich boys who were kind of casting off the values of their own social class. So the first publication of Lyrical Ballads in 1798 does not include this preface. It includes a short advertisement explaining a little bit about what the uh, basic concerns of these poems are going to be and the plan of the volume, but <clears throat> does not go into nearly as much detail as what we have here, right? So this particular preface is first published with the third edition of Lyrical Ballads. It went through several printings. It was actually quite successful for a little book of poems. Um, in 1802, it was produced in response to Suddy's request to Wordsworth to explain what his program for poetry was, right? What is it that unites all of the poems that are in this volume, right? What are these supposed to be about? So what were you able to figure out, if anything, about Wordsworth's poetic values from reading this preface? What does he seem to, what does he think he's doing? What does he think a poet is? How does he think a poet operates? Focuses on the things of beauty or things of nature. Or things okay. of natural progress. Okay, can, can you point us to a passage that says something like that? Well, he's looking for something. Anybody else have any impressions of this? feel like you've got anything about Wordsworth's beliefs and process from this. I, I thought it was like an expression, not really neat, that's not a very academic word, but on music, um, that he really wanted to like use like stuff from common life 
Mm -hmm. Because, like we said, a lot of older English poetry is all very fantastical, very night and lady, very, uh -huh. you know, like Chaucer and stuff like that. So yeah. that stuck out to me. Although, you know, a lot of, like on the one, there is that aristocratic tradition of chivalric romance, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at a lot of poetry by writers like Chaucer, by Renaissance writers like Edmund Spencer, they tend to write in both modes, right? Um, are any of you familiar at all with the Canterbury Tales? Okay, a couple of you are at least a little familiar with it, right? So that includes stories of knightly quest romance and stories about ordinary rural life, right? Now often the stories about ordinary rural life are, actually most of the stories tend to be comic in nature, right? Um, you know, the Miller's Tale is probably the best example of a sort of satire on rural life. Um, if you've never read it, it's, it is actually really funny and really filthy. Um, medieval poetry was really, really earthy. We tend to think of past ages as being more puritanical in their values than ours. Yeah, they weren't. <laughs> not, not in the slightest. Um, but yeah, so there was a tradition of writing about rural life and ordinary people in medieval English poetry. It wasn't all adventure and wizards and knights, right? In fact, only a small subset of medieval literature was about that. But yeah, so we are looking here at poems primarily about ordinary life. What else can you glean from this about Wordsworth's poetic values or what he thinks a poet's process should be? Yeah, Barry, go ahead. I think I found what I was trying to find. Okay. Uh, 296, he talks about a bunch of different poetries that associate with different aspects of life. Uh huh. Like death and trying to understand it. What was that? Yeah. Moral attachment when the early associated with the great and beautiful objects of nature. Uh -huh. The very last start of the bottom paragraph. Okay. Where the human mind is capable of being of being excited without the application of gross and violent stimulants, and he must have a very faint perception of its beauty and dignity. Unless I'm reading that. Okay. No, I, I, I don't think, and I think, yeah, what, what he is arguing against here, right, is the use of shock value in poetry, right? That poetry that aims to use language or intense, Im or, you know, simply intense imagery to evoke a powerful response out of you um, is not true to life, right? Um, and one of, the th one of the reasons he would say something like this is that neoclassical poetry was primarily about verbal dexterity. Right, so a neoclassical theorist would say, I think one of them did say, that language is the dress of thought, right? So language is the costume we dress up our thoughts in. And that figurative speech is the ornament of language, right? So we dress up our thoughts in language, and then to make them prettier or more interesting, we dress that language up in fancier language. For Wordsworth, part of the idea is to kind of strip that ornament off, right? Much as the jewels of the French aristocrats are torn off of them by the revolutionaries, right? Enough with all the ornaments, enough with all the fancy figurative language. Don't try to shock my brain into feeling something by saying it in a way that is bizarre in a way that impresses you with your own cleverness. Speak plainly. And plain speech can make for good poetry as well. Okay, any other impressions you got of this? Or anything, any questions you have about it? It seems he was trying to validate his word usage in okay. the poems. Okay, explain. Well, if I remember correctly, um, he went on to say 
not that his old stuff was bad, mm -hmm. but he was trying to validate attempting something new mm -hmm. for everyone instead of just, you know, the nobility higher ups right, right. and that. Yeah, I mean, his definition of a poet, right, if we look on page 299, right, right underneath, conveniently, the heading was a poet. Taking up the subject, then, upon general grounds, I ask, what is meant by the word poet? What is a poet? To whom does he address himself? And what language is to be expected from him? He is a man speaking to men. A man, it is true, and um, endued with a more lively sensibility, more enthusiasm and tenderness, who has a greater knowledge of human nature and a more comprehensive soul than are supposed to be common among mankind. A man pleased with his own passions and volitions, and who rejoices more than other men in the spirit of life that is in him, delighting to contemplate similar volitions and passions as manifested in the goings-on of the universe, and habitually impelled to create them where he does not find them. So, the first sentence of this long sort of chain of descriptions of the poet's mind, right? What's that first, what's that first little clause, that first important clause? He is a man speaking to men, right? So, who, is he seem, who does he seem to claim the poet is right there in that clause? Everyone else. An ordinary person, right? Equal. Yeah. But then he goes on to explain all the ways in which the poet is different from the ordinary person, right? He is like the ordinary person, but he feels and thinks much more intensely, right? So the difference here is not one of kind, right? The poet is not a different species from other human beings, but of degree, right? It sounds kind of pretentious. <laughs> it is a little, yeah. It's just a little I pretentious, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, Wordsworth is on the one hand trying really, really hard to reduce poetry's level of pomposity, but still a lot of what he says comes off to us as a little bit pompous. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this is that romantic poets in particular are very much focused on the processes of the individual mind, right? So while the neoclassical poets saw poetry as a craft, which the educated could learn to imitate, the romantics see it instead as a mental process, right? That the poem is somehow a product of the poet's individual genius, right? The poet's powers of imagination, right? So they attribute more power to the poet than a neoclassical writer would. Right, the poet actually has the power to change or affect or create his environment in some way. And I think because they're so concerned with mental processes, that's what makes them sound pompous to us. Right? Because they're so concerned with picking apart their own thoughts and feelings. Right? It's like you know, hearing a dozen freaking James Taylor songs playing all at once, right? They're all about him. They're all about himself. And that is really, in a lot of ways, the, the real revolution behind Romanticism is that it's a poetry, ultimately, frequently, of the self. It's an exploration of the self. Um, there's a, a, a scholar uh, just recently died at the age of about 107. Um, he was a very well-known uh, scholar of the Romantics. His name was M. H. Abrams, and Abrams wrote a book called *The Mirror and the Lamp*, which is actually the first thing on the bibliography that I gave you today. I think wrote it in the '50s, but it's still useful. Um, and Abrams describes the common Romantic poetic process. Uh, as a kind of outside, inside, outside process. He calls it the greater romantic lyric. 
and he sort of postulates that it works like this, right? That poet observes something in environment. Right, so you're walking out in nature, you're walking like along a bridge by a ruined abbey or something like that, and you describe what you see. That leads you to ruminate deeply, very, very deeply. on your place in the universe. Right, so the second part of the poem is almost always a rumination on how this thing you observed makes you reflect upon yourself in your own life. And it ends with the poet's Response to environment changed. By this mental process. Right, so it is, as I said, a kind of outside, inside, back to outside process. That Wordsworth pretty much pioneers. And really the most important part of this particularly for a poet like Wordsworth, is this inside part. That's the real meat of the romantic poem, this inside thinking part. This is where you really see what a poet is made of. Right, so let's go back to the beginning of the essay and Wordsworth's basic statement of purpose. There's a couple of passages that I quickly want to take you through here um, before we wrap up. So we look at this first paragraph on page 293 of the subject and language of poetry. The first volume of these poems has already been submitted to general perusal. It was published as an experiment which I hoped might be of some use to ascertain how far, by fitting to metrical arrangement a selection of the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation, that sort of pleasure and that quantity of pleasure may be imparted, from which a poet, which a poet may rationally endeavor to impart. So, on the one hand, he frames this in almost scientific language, right? This is a kind of experiment. I want to put these poems out into the world, and I want to see what they do. Right? I want to see how poetry of this kind affects a reader. I think the real, the real sort of kernel to extract from this paragraph is that by fitting to metrical arrangement a selection of the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation. So. Is he only interested in giving people common life and common language? It's common life in a kind of heightened, intensified emotional state, right? So he wants to convey through concrete language, concrete impressions, powerful emotional states. Heightened emotional states. Paul Roots like to heighten, like to heighten his emotional states with opium. We'll talk about that next week. So, a little further down the page, right? For the sake of variety, and from a consciousness of my own weakness, I was induced to request the assistance of a friend who furnished me with the poems of the Ancient Mariner, the Foster Mother's Tale, the Nightingale, and the poem entitled Love. I should not, however, have requested this assistance had I not believed that the poems of my friend would in a great measure have the same tendency as my own, and that there would be found a difference, there would be found no discordance in the colors of our style, as our opinions on the subject of poetry do almost entirely coincide. Now I point you to this passage because when we look at Coleridge next week, we will see that their opinions about poetry do not entirely coincide and never did. 
that Coleridge actually has some very, very different notions from Wordsworth, right? But remember, when we're reading Coleridge, the statement of common purpose from early in their association with each other. Several of my friends are anxious for the success of these poems from belief that if the views with which they were composed were indeed realized, a class of poetry would be produced well adapted to interest mankind permanently and not unimportant in the multiplicity and in the quality of its moral relations. And on this account, they've advised me to prefix a systematic defense of the theory upon which the poems were written. But I was unwilling to undertake the task because I knew that on this occasion, the reader would look coldly upon my arguments since I might be suspected of having been principally influenced by the selfish and foolish hope of reasoning him into an approbation of these particular poems. What's the key word in his little denial here? Reasoning, right? So he's stating here his antipathy towards neoclassical and rational modes of thinking, right? That I didn't want to write an essay defending my poetic principles because that sounded a little bit too orderly and neoclassical, right? Too rationalist, not organicist enough. I shouldn't have to defend these poetic principles. And yet, yeah, the use of the word reasoning there is your clue that he is directly referencing rationalism and neoclassicism. Okay, any questions so far? Everybody still with me so far? Okay, so a little further down to page 295, right? Where he's talking about his choice of subjects. Low and rustic life was generally chosen because in that condition, the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity, are less under restraint, and speak a plainer and more emphatic language. Because in that condition of life, our elementary feelings coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated. Because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings and from the necessary character of rural occupations are more easily comprehended and are more durable. And lastly, because in that condition, the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. The language, too, of these men is adopted, purified indeed from what appear to be its real defects, from all lasting and rational causes of dislike or disgust, because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of their language is originally derived. So here he's justifying his choice of language and his choice of subject, right? Why am I not writing in high-flown, sophisticated urban idioms? Why am I not writing about city subjects or court subjects? Because he feels that rural life and rural language are more directly connected to real, concrete things. Right, that it's easier to connect the language of a farmer to an actual object, to actual things in the world, than the language of a courtier or a professor or, you know, say, um, an urban poet, right? There's no artificiality in that language. There's no dressing up of speech. And so he's trying to strip away, again, all of that fancy dress that people put their words into. Probably more so in his poetry. That like, I, mean, I know that for most of you, most late 18th, early 19th century prose probably looks a little bit ornate and wordy. But compared to a slightly earlier writer, like, uh, say, Samuel Johnson, Wordsworth's prose is a model of simplicity and plainness, right? So for his era, he is speaking very, very plainly. Not so much for ours. All right, so. A couple more uh, just quick key phrases here I want you guys to, to focus on as you're trying to read Wordsworth's own poetry. 
right? Further down page 295, right? Just, For all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. write a good poem if you don't somehow feel the subject that you're writing about. Right? If it doesn't make you feel intensely, you can't write a poem about it. At least not a good poem. Now, he does revise this slightly later on on page 303, right? I have said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. The emotion is contemplated till by a species of reaction, the tranquility gradually disappears, and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced and does itself actually exist in the mind. So there is a strong relationship for Wordsworth between feeling and thought. Right? You need the feeling to produce the necessary impetus for the poem, but you need the thought to actually shape it into a poem. Right? You can't just leave that feeling by itself. You feel your way to an idea and then think your way to a poem. Right, so feeling and thought. Are intimately linked in the production of poetry, right? Feeling plus thought equals poem. Right, sample of one. Now, what else do I want you to, uh, okay, so. If we go to page 296, um, above where Barry had pointed us to earlier, can I get a volunteer uh, to read the beginning of that first full paragraph? I have said that each of these poems has a purpose. Yeah, Ashley, go ahead. I have said that each of these poems has a purpose. I have also informed my reader what this purpose will be principally to be, namely to illustrate the manner in which our feelings and ideas are associated in a state of, of excitement. But speaking in language somewhat more appropriate, it is to follow the fluxes and refluxes of the mind when agitated by the great and simple affections of our nature. Okay, thank you. You can stop there. So, we often regard the Romantics as nature poets or as, you know, poets who write about feelings. But what is Wordsworth here saying the real subject of poetry is? I think we've already hinted at that with some of our descriptions here as well. What is a romantic poem really about, really concerned with? State of excitement. You need a state of excitement to, to write a poem, right? But if we look at this pattern that the good M.H. Abrams has laid out for us, right? What's the process that a romantic poem ultimately describes? What's really at the center of the poem? Words. Okay, well, it's made of words. <laughs> Be a change. A change in well, a change in what, or a purpose in what? The reader's react, or the writer's reaction to the environment. Yeah, it's all about the mind, right? It's all about the way the. Not yet, not so much the reader. They don't really care how you process it. It's about the writer thinking his way through a situation, right? 
So the focus of a romantic poem is pretty much always the mind. That's what these poems are really about. The writer's mind. The writer's mind, yes. The writer's mind and the writer's creative process. All right, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? I think I've pretty much said what I wanted to say about this preface and what I want you to take away from class today. Um, so if you don't have any questions about any of this, um, I'll give you back the quizzes and I'll let you go a little bit early today. Right, so next time, remember, we're going to be looking at those two poems and I want you to try to apply, if you can, Wordsworth's theories about poetry to those poems. Right? How well does he follow his own patterns? How well does he seem to follow his own advice? Okay. All right, so have a good weekend. We will see you on Tuesday.